All right. Myar is currently, I think, there we go. Myar is currently an assistant professor of architecture and the director of historic preservation and design at Texas Tech University. He received his PhD in architecture from Penn State and his professional master of architecture degree from Assad University in Tehran. As a practitioner, researcher, and educator, Mayar concentrates on modernism understood in relation to historical and contemporary contexts. This presentation has the dual purpose of developing a systematic methodology for designing new constructions and adding to or reviving existing buildings in historic neighborhoods and demonstrating an effective pedagogy in regard to historic preservation at the undergraduate level. Shape grammar as a computational design methodology is used to analyze the historic fabric of the urban area and to create a configurable hybrid design that is both compatible with that context and reflective of the needs of the design of the contemporary urban setting. A previously developed methodology for verifying and analyzing hybridity in architectural design is expanded in this presentation as a foundation for designing a new construction or addition in a historic urban context. And with that, Mayar, you can go ahead and begin. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Melanie, for that introduction. Let me share my screen. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. And you can hear me, of course. Okay. Yep. Because I don't see anyone. Let me... Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm um, very happy um, and honored to be here um, and uh, share my work with you. <clears throat> I actually forgot that I uh, wrote that um, abstract for, for this presentation. So you may um, find this presentation a little <laughs> different than, than what uh, I wrote in the abstract. But um, since um, because of the nature of um, this uh, symposium um, that we want to share our, um, not only share our work, but also to um, make a discussion for um, future work, I decided not to um, share with you one research project, but um, instead I want to um, give you an overview of my work and um, things that are, that I'm interested in. Um, so I will give you a background uh, information of myself and um, I will talk about uh, the work that I have done before joining HPP uh, at Cornell. Uh, during the time that I was at Cornell, um, during the uh, time that I was at Penn State doing my PhD and uh, my current research at um, uh, Texas Tech University. So I was born and raised in um, Iran, um, a country with more than 2,500 years of um, architectural history. Um, at the right, you see three examples of um, historical buildings in Iran. Um, at bottom, you see Persepolis in, in Shiraz in southern part of um, Iran. And, and these two uh, top images, the middle one and the top one, are related to Isfahan, um, which is uh, related to the Islamic era. Um, so as a child, I was um, spending time um, in these buildings, in these historic sites, um, mostly in summer times when we were like traveling, traveling to uh, to other cities. Um, I, I never lived in uh, in Esfahan um, or or, Shila, or Shiraz. Um, at the left side, you see um, images that uh, kind of change my um, appetite towards modernism. 
So the top one, you all know, um, La Tourette, designed by Le Corbusier. I visited this building and I was like, wow, if this is, if this is architecture, I want to be an architect. And then at the bottom, uh, I'm sorry, at the bottom, you see this image, which is related to the National Bank in uh, northern Iran, in the city that I was born and raised. So, uh, and this is a time that uh, there was no online banking and we were um, going to bank like often, maybe like in daily basis. And um, I was kind of interested in this building, which was a, still is a, um, a great example of um, mid-century architecture in Iran. Um, so I got interested in architecture um, and I went to architecture school. I was trained as an architect. And when I finished uh, my study, I started working um, in a firm in, in Tehran, the capital city in Iran. Um, so I was involved in, so this, this is a uh, well-known big firm in Iran. And uh, I was in, involved in different projects. For example, this one, which is a huge, which was a huge project, um, Iranian embassy in, in Beirut. And there were like uh, millions of, of people working on this project. And I was one of them. Uh, uh, working, but at the same time, I got involved in other smaller uh, projects. So this one, for example, is a, a rehabilitation project related to um, House Museum of Nima Yushij. Um, Nima Yushij um, is a contemporary Persian poet, and um, the firm was asked to um, rehabilitate the birthplace of uh, Nima Yushij to a house museum and. Um, this was a very interesting project for me because um, uh, the team that were working on this project were very small, like a four person team. And I was part of that. And I learned a lot about um, architectural preservation. So um, I learned um, a lot about the way in which we need to work with a, a historic building, the way in which we can or cannot change um, a part of historic building and how we can add to a historic building. The left part, as you can see here, is an addition um, to this house museum. Um, also, I learned a lot about the idea of um, not designing on a blank piece of paper, but learning from uh, the past to design for the future. Um, and this, is, this was something that I learned specifically in this project. Um, after that project, I got involved in another uh, um, kind of preservation, planning preservation uh, project, um, which was focused on uh, replanning, redesigning a uh, village in northern Iran that hosted a 500-year-old uh, uh, cemetery, White Well Cemetery in northern part of Iran. Um, again, I learned about how to work with um, older historic uh, projects that are in use. So people are living in this village and they still want to uh, use this, uh, uh, this cemetery, but um, how we can deal with everyday needs and uh, preserve what we have uh, in terms of our culture. Uh, the interesting about this cemetery was that although this was a Islamic uh, cemetery, it, the, the way that it was organized and the idea about that the design were uh, pre-Islamic. So the relationship of uh, pre-Islamic and Islamic cemetery was, um, was interesting in this particular uh, project. Then um, I started uh, documenting um, projects basically randomly. And um, this was uh, a project that I documented with a couple of friends in Northern Iran. This is a uh, grand hotel. Um, uh, this is called the Grand Hotel of Ramsar is a um, early 20th century uh, building in Northern Iran. Um, it's an amazing project um, still is. Uh, so the, the, the time that I or we um, documented this building, there was no plan for uh, preservation, but now there are plans for, for preservation and um, the documentation that we prepared um, are used in the uh, process. 
Um, continuing that idea of like randomly uh, documenting uh, buildings and projects, uh, when I was graduated uh, in Tehran I, and I was working in uh, the firm that I mentioned, with a couple of uh, colleagues, we started uh, documenting examples of modern um, architecture in Tehran. And uh, we developed um, a few research projects. Um, and uh, for example, this one, which concentrate on, on the openings of uh, these modern uh, buildings, or this one, which is uh, concentrated on buildings that are part of the Tehran University. Um, um, so we were like um, developing this, this project and we were able to um, make Domus involved in, in that process. And uh, uh, Domus actually, um, the Italian journal, they um, did a whole issue on Tehran based on um, our research. Um, at, at that point, I, I found out that, okay, I need um, to have more um, knowledge about historic preservation and how to deal with a historic pro project, not only as an architect, but also as a um, trained historic preservationist. And of course, the best place to get that training uh, was and still is uh, Cornell. So um, I started my um, study at Cornell with um, uh, Professor Michael Tomlin and Jeff Chusett in 2010. And um, like many of you, I learned about design guidelines in Jeff's uh, class. And it was uh, fascinating for me that um, how a document can be used for um, designing um, or developing new uh, structures in a historic context. Uh, that was something that I, I really enjoyed uh, thinking about it and, and working on it. Um, when I was at Cornell, um, I kind of continued that idea of like randomly um, documenting building and I started uh, documenting buildings that related to the 20th century or um, 20th century modern architecture in and around Ithaca, New York. Um, with the um, help of Michael and Jeff, I um, got involved in this project at Historic Ithaca. They were, um, they, they wanted uh, to make a tour of modern architecture in Ithaca as part of their uh, fundraising event. And I put together that tour for them. And I think it was a very successful tour for them and also a kind of an eye opening for myself. So the information that I gathered for that tour, um, kind of, I, I used it as the base of my uh, thesis. Um, so my thesis was uh, focused on the architecture of Raymond Viner Hall, um, who, designed and built uh, several buildings in, in Ithaca. Um, Raymond was son of Walter Hall. Um, here at top left, you see Walter Hall in the center working in the Falling Water uh, project. Walter Hall was the main contractor of uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's Falling Water. And the building at the bottom is a building that Raymond, the son designed and uh, Walter um, built actually. Uh, it's called Lean Hall. You may know this building from uh, Work Weekend uh, 2016. I know Melanie, I remember that uh, building very well. Um, and uh, you may also know the building from the exhibition that was um, organized as part of the uh, HPP 40th anniversary at, uh, at Cornell, Work in Progress. So when I graduated from Cornell, um, I kind of followed Raymond's uh, work in other places uh, because Raymond was originally from uh, Pennsylvania. Um, so there, there, there are lots, lots of uh, buildings that he designed in uh, Pennsylvania. And I found out this building in uh, State College, PA, where the uh, Penn State University is located. When I started my uh, PhD study at, at Penn State, I first visited this building and uh, I, I enjoyed visiting that building a lot. I'm still in contact with the, the owner. They're, they're great. They're not architects. They don't know anything about architecture, but they love having a modern building. Um, very soon, I found out that if uh, you want to work on modernism in State College area, Raymond Hall, although is the first 
person who designed a modern uh, building in the area, but is not the, the main one. So the main guy is uh, William Hajar, um, who was a, a faculty at Penn State and uh, a practitioner in the area. So I um, try to uh, document um, um, William Hajar's work, this time not very randomly uh, because I had something in mind. So I started documenting uh, these buildings and the buildings were um, interesting for me. And as you can see in these images, there are clear uh, relation with uh, principles of modern architecture. But at the same time, these buildings are kind of blending in the neighborhood. So when you drive around the neighborhood, you will not uh, see them as great examples of uh, uh, modern architecture because of the, the material and the way that uh, it the buildings are situated in, in the lot and, and, and many else. So, um, of course, I had to put a tour first uh, and I uh, organized a tour uh, with other colleagues at Penn State, um, a tour as part of the Docomomo um, uh, tour. Um, and I called it College Town Modernism because um, this uh, modern architecture that I um, found there was um, not modernism that I knew from the books, but was a special kind of uh, um, modern architecture. So this became my um, idea for my PhD um, study that um, the residential architecture of uh, Hajar is a mixture of uh, traditional American architecture and, and uh, uh, modern European architecture. Basically, his architecture incorporates uh, many of the shapes, rules, and features of both European modern architecture and traditional American architecture. So I used shape grammar as a computational design methodology to uh, verify and describe this hybridity between modern and traditional architecture in Hajar's uh, work. Soon I discovered that this um, uh, quality, uh, which I believed helped uh, popular, popularizing uh, modernism in the United States, can also be found in the work of other uh, faculty pr practitioners in other um, US college towns. You see a couple of examples here at the bottom. Um, so I visited uh, many uh, college towns with architecture programs and um, I um, researched the uh, work of uh, faculty practitioners in mid 20th century. And I, I, I found um, very interesting for myself that how these um, faculty members, how these faculty practitioners, most of which were um, trained both as um, an architect in the Beaux-Arts um, system and also in the modern uh, pedagogy system in the United States, how they uh, put together ideas from modern architecture and from their local context to make a um, sellable architecture for their um, audience in college towns. Sorry, the, the, there was some, something in the chat. Oh, great, great. Um, yes, so, um, so, so these uh, uh, critical questions became um, the main point of my study. Can shape grammar be used to verify and describe the possible hybridity between modern and traditional architecture in Hajar's work? And more broadly, can shape grammars be used uh, to describe architectural hybridity phenomenon in general? And what influence did the social and technological context have on the layout of the um, houses designed by Hajar. And the way that I uh, tried to answer these questions were um, to study, to analyze Hajar's life and architecture and to develop a shape grammar um, to be able to understand the architectural language of um, William Hajar and also to develop shape grammars to um, understand arch architectural language of those uh, likely influences and then compare these architectural languages to, to each other. 
and to identify aspects of the social and technological context that may explain such uh, an influence. Uh, so to briefly talk about shape grammar, um, shape grammars in computation are a specific class of production systems based on an initial shape or a set of uh, finite shapes and transformational shape rules. So you have um, an in initial shape and then you have some rules that you can apply them as many times as you want to come up with a design. Um, so shape grammar has been used for analyzing um, existing examples of architecture. For example, here um, at the bottom, you see an uh, example of um, uh, using shape grammar for analyzing Frank Lloyd Rice uh, uh, prairie style houses. Um, I um, studied Hajar's work and Hajar's life. Um, he, was, um, he was born in Massachusetts, went to Carnegie Mellon, um, studied architecture, then went to uh, MIT. And the time that he was at MIT was the time that uh, Groupius and Brewer moved to um, Harvard to, uh, to teach there. And uh, there was lots of interaction between Harvard um, and MIT. And many of um, MIT students, including Hajar, um, were influenced by um, European modernism, Bauhaus uh, um, style architecture. Um, and um, after graduation, he uh, um, moved to Washington, taught uh, a few years over there, and then moved to Penn State um, and um, studied, uh, sorry, uh, taught for a, a few years and then uh, start uh, probably because he was busy doing um, his tenure process. After that, he started um, uh, building left and right in the area. Um, he designed many, many buildings in the area, including 33 houses only in 10 years. Um, so she was, he was a businessman, not only an architect, but also a businessman. Um, so I studied all of uh, the single family houses that he designed in the area. And um, I came up with some rules that, can, that could define um, his architectural language. Um, and then I did the same for Groupius and Brewer partnership because I found out that uh, based on my historical uh, research, there is a connection between his architecture and um, architecture of uh, Groupius and Brewer. So I studied all um, uh, single family houses that Groupius and Brewer, Groupius and or Brewer designed in the United States and uh, came up with uh, rules that could define their architectural language and uh, did the same process for um, traditional American houses of the uh, context in State College PA. For doing that, I refer to um, all the contributing houses uh, in a historic neighborhood that hosts um, uh, most of Hajar's um, designs in, in it as well. So this historic neighborhood is adjacent to, to the university and uh, many of the houses are um, uh, belong to the faculty who are teaching at Penn State. So I was also able to uh, come up with some rules to define um, uh, architectural language for the traditional American houses in the uh, State College area. Um, and then at the next uh, stage, I compared um, uh, these grammars or do these architectural languages um, in three different ways. Uh, the first way was comparing the rules of these three grammars, uh, traditional Hajar and Groupius, and find similarities between rules. Um, and uh, with that, I was able to put together um, some numbers to understand that, okay, for example, 25% of Hajar's work are, or Hajar's architecture are unique to his architecture. And let's say like 54% are um, uh, similar to work of um, uh, uh, Groupius and Brewer and 29% and are very similar to uh, the traditional um, architecture of the context. Of course, this will not uh, show the influences of one on the other one, but it shows the similarities. Another system of comparison was to um, compare um, houses or uh, the way in which houses were um, generated by the grammar that I developed. Um, and I, um, I, I was able to study 
um, the the step by step derivation of these um, houses by my grammar. And the third uh, version of, or third third way of comparison was using grammars to generate uh, similar designs. Um, so this this is really interesting for me. So at the left you see a design um, a house that was designed by Hajar in State College. And on, on the right, you see a, a design that was generated by the computer program that I developed based on um, architectural language of Gropius and Brewer. So this house on the right, or this design on the right is not uh, an existing design. This, is, this was generated by the computer program. And you can see similarities between these two um, designs based on the, um, let's say, um, geometry or the way in which uh, the night and day activities are divided, but at the same time, you can see other uh, differences. For example, the size of bedroom in this design that was created by the uh, grammar of Gropius and Brewer and the original design by, by Hajar. So you can see that the size, in, uh, size of bedrooms are, are smaller in, 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 in um, this house that was generated by the computer program or the placement of um, bathroom in or bathrooms in the, this design versus the original design of Hajar or the way that um, the, the house uh, was designed by Hajar was um, like kind of split level but the, the, the grammar generated this house the house on the right and on one level. Um, so basically I was able to develop a systematic methodology to analyze hybridity and architectural design. But at that point, my idea for future work was to consider this systematic methodology to, um, um, to research other um, types and styles of architecture across um, all areas. And there were uh, two different avenue in, in doing this. One, considering the architecture of the past in order to show the architecture evolves through a hybridization process. And um, second, to imagine an architecture of the future by, by applying a process of hybridization to generate new architectural styles appropriate to a given context. So um, when I graduated and went to uh, Texas Tech University to teach, I followed this idea of using the same systematic methodology to this time to generate um, uh, design, to generate architectural design and to use it in um, rehabilitation process in, in historic preservation. I, I also use the same methodology to um, analyze existing as examples of architecture. Here you see a, a project that um, I'm, um, I'm involved with one of my students and uh, this is a um, study in, in Tehran, in the capital of Iran, in a um, street called Nasser Khosro, which is part of the downtown and, and hosts many of the 18th uh, century uh, examples of uh, um, architecture in Tehran. These are examples that uh, people, kind of like touristic, uh, touristic um, spots for, for, uh, for Tehran. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, new construction in, in this street, they're, they're not compatible with, uh, with anything, not only the um, existing context, but also uh, they're not compatible with um, normal uh, architecture of, of today. So they're just like randomly popping up. Um, and uh, my student actually um, started this idea of what what can we do for uh, the future of this area? And then we started working on this uh, with the same methodology to, um, to, to see how, how we can use um, shape grammar basically as a guideline, as a design guideline for future uh, um, design. So uh, this, um, so the shape grammar that we develop can um, generate houses that generate uh, basically designs more uh, focus on elevation on, on facades than, than plan. Uh, houses that are um, part of the context that are learning from the context and at the same time are part of the new or uh, contemporary um, uh, norm and also following um, uh, design guidelines or following uh, um, code and zoning and um, sustainability uh, uh, guidelines and, and all these things that architects need to pay attention to. 
so this is another uh, project that I'm involved at the moment uh, from Bauhaus to the uh, Levant. Uh, Levant. Um, so this is a project that I'm uh, collaborating with uh, a colleague in Cyprus. And what we're doing is to use uh, the same uh, methodology to analyze uh, modern architecture of Cyprus and uh, see the influences of uh, the Bauhaus style on um, modern architecture of uh, Cyprus. So we, we started this by focusing on uh, single family houses in um, uh, Nicosia, the, the capital city of Cyprus. And now we're, uh, we're trying to expand it more to the region and not only to that, that city. Something interesting that we've um, uh, uh, found out when analyzing the uh, architecture was that um, in the traditional um, city, there were lots of uh, places, small places, um, something like plazas in, the, in all neighborhoods that people could get together and use for socializing. Um, in, when the, the city uh, went through a process of modernization, uh, so those uh, spaces were uh, kind of deleted from the, the city. So now there's not such uh, places in, in, the, in the town. And um, from mid kind of 20th century, we see those communal spaces inside the property line. So people are introducing those um, open spaces into their, their houses to have more communal spaces, either in single family houses or in a larger housing project. So that was um, an interesting um, observation that uh, we found out through the, uh, analyze, through the process of um, uh, analyzing. So although this project is currently uh, for um, analyzing and finding the influences of uh, Bauhaus to uh, the modern examples of uh, um, houses in Cyprus, but um, so the plan is to use shape grammar to um, as basically as a design guidelines for future rehabilitation project, how we can rehabilitate this, these buildings for, because so, so although these are modern buildings, but um, life has been changed throughout the uh, last 60, 70 years. And lots of um, um, owners want to kind of change and, uh, and, and, and rehabilitate their buildings. So we need, a, we need basically a plan for um, this kind of rehabilitation projects in the near future. I know that we're out of time, so I try to be quick. I only have a few more projects to show. So um, I use the same methodology in short-term uh, projects as well. Um, so these are two examples, uh, examples of two workshops that um, I organize. Um, on the right, and so both are um, following the idea of contextualizing global architecture, how we can do, um, how we can adapt locally uh, the international style architecture. And um, at the right, for example, you see that um, two kind of not related um, styles or architectural language were like brought together. One was an um, architecture that uh, developed by um, Gropius and Brewer. And the other one is architecture that uh, we know as Persian gardens. So um, I put together these two um, kind of unrelated uh, shape grammars and ask the participant to come up with a mix uh, grammar and use those rules to uh, introduce new buildings that are based on the modern architecture and also based on the context because this was um, in Iran in Shiraz and um, Shiraz is the uh, birthplace of Persian garden. So this is the last project that I'm uh, sharing. Um, I. I uh, use this method for a longer um, or a um, semester long uh, project as well uh, in an architectural uh, undergraduate architectural setting. So this was a uh, um, studio and uh, students were asked to um, design an addition to the uh, new gallery in New York. Um, so you um, all probably know that new gallery is um, hosting uh, Gustav Klimt uh, portrait of Adele and lots of other uh, work by uh, Klimt and other German and um, Austrian um, artists. 
Um, so uh, the students were asked to design a building that is compatible with the existing building and compatible with um, uh, guidelines of the, um, the city and also uh, code and zoning and all those things that architects need to pay attention to. And students uh, used shape grammar um, to do the analysis and to, to generate some examples. But since the, the grammar that they were developing uh, were not like fully developed in, in that semester. So they had to actually manually change the generated uh, design at the end to be able to come up with some uh, presentable um, um, designs at the end uh, that they could present to the, to the jury at, at the end of the semester. Um, so at the end, I want to um, engage you in a conversation by saying that um, what I'm doing or what I like to do is um, kind of in, on this slide. So architects and preservationists, they, uh, they want to do customized design. On the other hand, um, construction companies, uh, building industry, they want to do mass production. And, with, um, and I'm looking for a solution that can advantage uh, both sides, that can, ha can have advantages from both sides, can have um, um, ideas, uh, customized ideas from architects and preservations, and also um, ideas from mass production or or um, faster production um, that can help construction companies to uh, participate, basically. Um, so that's it for me. I would happy to answer questions um, or hear your comments. Thank you. Thank you, Meyer. Does anyone have a reaction or a question or comment? So Jessica is saying, uh, I, I read that in during my presentation that we have a Phil Halak uh, home in my community. Where is it? Hello. Hi. Hi. I actually, I want to get your email address because I'm starting this kind of um, so, social media advocacy effort in the next county over uh, Clinton County mm -hmm. for specifically the Lock Haven community. And I was going through uh, the modernist architecture archives at Penn State and I came across Phil Halleck. Was any of your work in that archive specifically at Penn State? Um, so um, the work that I produced, no, it's not in the archive, but uh, uh, Penn State Library is putting together an online um, version of um, what we produced there as part of the tour. So um, we, we had uh, Phil Halak as part of that um, Docomomo tour as well. So uh, probably it, it should be um, up in their website now. You can check Penn State Libraries and, and ask, or, or you can email me and I will put you in touch with people at Penn State. Okay. But work of uh, William Hajar, they are all in, in Penn State Special Archive. Okay, yeah, I'll definitely be reaching out to you. I have a, I kind of want to pick your brain about the architecture in the area a little bit and kind of see uh, what your findings have been. I would be happy to, to be in touch and help if I can. Any other they comments, are? question? Yes. Um, your, your, it was a fascinating presentation. Uh, Thank you. I also am going to be in touch with you because a very close colleague of mine who taught with me at Chinese University of Hong Kong, Andrew Lee, was a I very know Andrew, yes. colleague, colleague of George Steiny and George Mitchell. Yes. And yes. Yeah. I think he'd be, if you obviously know him, I guess. But yes. anyway, I wanted to put you in touch with him. I also... Uh, in my pre-Cornell uh, days, Michael Tomlin is the only one knowing this here. Um, 
probably. I taught English in the Anjuman Iran America in Shiraz. Excellent. Uh, in um, 1978 and until, um, until events. I was not born at that time. I know. <laughs> but anyway, uh, uh, it would be interesting to be in touch with you at many levels. Yes, yes. Thank you I for a to. very stimulating presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Sherry, you have your hands up. I just wanted to thank you for uh, a wonderful presentation. That was truly thank engaging. You. It's very rare in my work these days that I get to think what I call uh, deep thoughts about design. Uh, and I appreciate that opportunity. Um, wonderful work. I look forward to hearing more about it. Thank you. Thank you. I actually had a quick question for you, Mayar. Please go ahead. Mayar. Um, more of a technical oriented question, but um, what, if any, are the limitations of the shape grammar um, that you've experienced or that your students have found, especially as it pertains to developing design guidelines like you had initially tried to use it for? So um, I have not used it for design guidelines yet. So that's, that's something that I'm really interested in doing it. Um, but limitations, I think the most important limitation is it, it, it takes time for someone to learn how to work with shape grammar. So it's, if, if we want to do it, so I, I thought this is a great um, tool for me to use in studio setting, for example. And I will use it again because I, I enjoyed using it in, in that particular studio that I showed, but specifically for analyzing um, what we have, analyzing the context, analyzing code and zoning or learning from, from, from them, not for generating a um, new design because it's, it's, it's very hard for student to um, be in a studio setting and deal with lots of things that they have to deal with as, a, as an undergraduate student. And at the same time, learn uh, shape grammar and how to work with with computer or uh, manually um, do the shape grammar and uh, be able to generate something from it. So I learned that I have to do um, the work for them and then they, they use it as, as an extra uh, tool. So that's, that's, that's the main um, uh, limitation, I think, for me to use it for um, a studio setting. For workshop, because workshops are more fun and, uh, and students are not uh, necessarily learning uh, shape grammar to use it for the result. Um, it's possible because it's like only a few days and you can just give them something and they, they use it and learn, learn about a new tool. That's, that's all. But um, if, you're, if you're asking me that um, if this is, a, uh, this is a good tool to generate new designs or to um, um, work as guidelines in in rehabilitation projects in like one semester in short term? No, but, uh, but for long term, I think it, it will work. Jack, you also have a question, I believe. Um, yes, thanks. Uh, and with apologies if I missed it, um, to what degree did, did you look at with the shape, grammar, uh, proportion, and in particular, uh, so-called sacred geometries and uh, Golden sections and the whole whole range uh, did that factor? Did, did you consider those? So um, basically, it's called shape grammar because it's all about shape, and um, you think that it's only about shape, but it's not only about shape because to to be able to come up with the rules, you have to study the context, you have to study the history, you have to study the um, you have to do a social um, study, um, contextual analysis, because um, um, when you design a building, right, as an architect, when you design a building, you consider many things, shapes and like, for example, golden ratio is one of them, right? There are lots of other things that you have to pay attention to it. For example, code and zoning, for example, technical issues. Um, one, um, one example, when I was working on Hajar's architecture in State College, so I found that um, the, 
um, um, width of the living room. So obviously he wanted to have like open living room, but the width of the living room was limited. And after a while I found out, okay, okay that, that's a limitation because of the, uh, the technical aspects of architecture because they didn't have like, uh, or it was like expensive to make beams that, that, that could um, span longer than a, a particular width. So there are layers um, that can define um, that grammar and shape. And for example, golden ratio is one of them, right? There are, there are many layers that uh, you need to study and you need to put together to come up with a shape grammar that you can say that this can analyze the architecture, architecture language of a particular architect or style or whatever. I don't know if that answers your question, but it was a thought that I have when I, when I heard your question. Great, is there anyone else that had a comment or question? Jeff? Another question, more related to your last slide about construction companies, which seems to relate very much to Michael's uh, current passion about uh, real estate development with respect to our profession, which is obviously extremely important. Have you actually tried yet to create that uh, Venn diagram uh, between um, individual architectural design and construction companies? I'm, I'm sitting here in Southern California in, a, in the San Fernando Valley uh, where William Mellenthin, after the Second World War, <laughs> uh, was an architectural designer who ran a construction company extremely successfully here. Uh, in fact, I just came back from walking my dog around the neighborhood and there are just all kinds of these designs. Uh, I mean, it would be very interesting to hear whether you've been able to try to create that synergy again. I'm just curious whether that's an aspirational goal or something you've had some uh, experience with? So honestly, when I was um, a PhD student, I, um, I was looking for a um, job after graduation. And uh, my advisor um, told me that it might be interesting to put together a proposal for a postdoc. And then um, uh, thankfully I, I got a job and I started a career. So. Um, but um, unfortunately, I didn't continue with that idea of the postdoc. So the idea was that to contact these kind of uh, uh, companies, particularly we contacted Toll Brothers. I don't know if you're familiar with them or not, but if you go to Toll Brothers website, they do a similar thing at the moment, right? You can, you can go there. There are a couple of a few questions you answer that, for example, I need a, a three bedroom house two stories with this kind of uh, design with this and that. So you, uh, you answer to some questions and then they give you one design. Um, so they're not producing that design, right? They have an archive of several uh, plans and they, they basically categorize them and then they give you um, one design uh, based on the answers of your, your question. So what I was, um, um, proposing was to, to come up with a shape grammar, uh, to come up with a computer uh, program that can actually design a new project for that particular uh, person that asked that answering those questions. If next person answers the same question, a little bit different, he or she will get another design, not the same designs. Because uh, when you categorize um, lots of answers Lots of different answers may result in similar design, but in, in my case, that wouldn't happen. Of course, that needs a lot of uh, work and, and support to, um, to come up with, uh, with that um, computer program. But I started thinking about it, but I then uh, didn't continue working on it. But now I'm very interested in seeing that in terms of rehabilitation projects. Michael. Michael. If you want to talk to a vice president of Toll Brothers, I can uh, arrange that. That's awesome. Yeah, the reality is that I know these people. Uh, the Toll Brothers have been backers of the real estate program here uh, in a number of ways. 
Uh, you would find that there's a little wrinkle in your thinking, and that is Toll Brothers is uh, able to economize because of their scale. Correct. And the scale is such that um, they produce at least five houses every day. Correct. Um, you know, at, at current rate. Uh, it varies because they have regional offices across the country um, and the distribution of the resources is not equal. Um, but it is possible with respect to the question of rehabilitation, um, toll shows no interest thus far um, in the principles in rehabilitation per se, but it's largely coming back to my thought as Jeff has suggested, it has to do with the money. Um, basically, if you can work out the financing um, between the extremes that you posed in a sweet spot that makes sense so that you could financialize it in such a way as to realize the benefits, it is possible, at least on a limited basis. Um, and there are examples of this being done uh, but once again, it's the high end of the market you're talking about, Toll Brothers Houses. I have a catalog actually here, a couple of them in, in the office. Um, it's rather surprising to me um, how expensive they are. Yes, yes. And, and they're appreciating uh, accordingly. Um, and the appreciation over time uh, the gain in value is what essentially the turnover is all about because you get into a, a different model in a different part of the country. But we could have another discussion about this. I don't want to occupy. And this is, this is not only in building industry, right? If you go to, oh, yeah. for example, Nike website and try to buy a customized shoe is, is the same idea. So you can like, try. Yeah. But they're, they're expensive as well. Very much. Jack, did you have another question? Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, no, okay. All right. Well, if no one else has a comment or question, I think that will conclude this, this, this session. Um, I'd like to thank all of our presenters again tonight for such engaging presentations. Um, you can join us tomorrow at 10 a.m. for the final day of the symposium. Uh, we will have two additional alumni speakers, followed by a closing keynote by Sherry Ferrier. Thanks, everyone, and have a good night. Thank you all very much. Have a great night. See you tomorrow.